Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, this evening's talk hosted by Center for Iranian Studies, although we exist under the umbrella of SOAS Middle East Institute. But as this talk was uh, very much focused on Iran and several anniversaries have come together, we decided to have an extra session in addition to our Tuesday evening lectures to have this talk tonight. So we're gradually waiting for all our participants to join us. I see the numbers increasing, but um, uh, I might as well start the formal beginning of the um, evening by welcoming you from wherever you are. I hope you are safe and well. It's a rather lovely evening, Thursday evening in London. Uh, I'm absolutely delighted. It's not only an institutional pleasure, it's a personal privilege to be able to welcome Professor Raul Bakhosh to a lecture at SOAS. Any one of you who have ever looked up a reference about modern history of Iran, not just Iran, actually Middle East, but certainly um, about the, you know, the reigns of the Ayatollahs, about work on the Pahlavi and Qajar, you would have used one of the many sources authored by Professor Bakhosh. Um, there is so much to tell, the resume is quite long, but um, uh, Professor Bakhshis, I feel that he almost belongs to UK a little bit because of completing certainly his uh, doctoral uh, um, thesis at University of Oxford. But of course, the undergraduate and graduate studies, you know, postgraduate was at University of Harvard. Uh, Professor Bakhshis has uh, the advantage of not only being an academic, but also of being a journalist. So having written for Iranian newspapers, but also for the Financial Times, for the Times, and that certainly comes across in his writings. Not only is solid and laden with academic weight, but it's very readable. So everyone enjoys that. I was thinking earlier, uh, this term, you know, around February, you know, we always look for anniversaries or occasions to gear uh, talks around that. And of course, double blessing is when a book has also been published. So that really is the cherry on the cake. And of course, we know that we have just had <coughs> the birthday of Reza Shah that a few days ago, I think 15th of March, um, that has just passed. But also this year is the uh, centenary, the 100 years since the coup that began the um, path of uh, Reza Khan to becoming the monarch. And I thought, well, these are perfect um, occasions. And then, of course, to really make it fantastic, here I have the book for you. The recent, the latest publication by Professor Bakhosh entitled The Fall of Reza Shah. So, you know, I was so delighted. I rather uh, very nervously wrote to Professor Bakhosh saying, would you consider joining us to give a talk? And I was delighted when you so graciously accepted. So welcome, Professor Bakhosh, to the virtual School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London. Are you well? How, how is life in the United States? Well, it's fine as we all are living under the shadow of the coronavirus, but otherwise we've adjusted. And That's we're having, unlike London, a rather gray, cold day here <laughs> okay, in yeah. Tehran. We've changed weather, yes. yes. Absolutely. So if I think uh, quite a you know, majority of uh, our uh, participants who've signed up have arrived, and I think we do need to start. Um, so I um, invite you all, and of course, invite Professor Bakhosh to present the talk this evening, which with the title of Life and Death of a King in Exile, the final years of Reza Shah Pahlavi, 
founder of modern Iran. So it's all at your hand. Now the stage is yours or the screen is yours, Professor Bakhar. Thank you, Dr. Bashar. As we know, Reza Shah seized power in Iran in 1921. And for the next 20 years, he dominated it. And with the help of very capable advisors, he transformed and modernized it. His reign, his considerable achievements, and also his failures have been written about extensively in books and in articles. My focus, I hope covering new ground, is on the events and circumstances that, that in 1941 brought about an abrupt end to his reign and resulted in his involuntary abdication and exile, his life in exile, and his always tense and prickly relations with the British in this period who had uh, in whose hands he had fallen. When World War II broke out, Reza Shah declared Iran's neutrality. He wanted to protect Iran against the ravages of the war. Iran also had important trade relations with belligerents on both sides of the conflict, important to his ambitious economic and industrial programs. Britain was crucial to the operations of Iran's oil industry, the main source of Iran's foreign exchange revenues. Germany was deeply involved in Iran's industrialization. Uh, the Soviet Union provided the overland route through which much of the trade between Iran and Europe passed. Yet in August 1941, the Soviet Union and Britain invaded Iran and occupied it. The stated reason was the threat to allied interests posed by the large German presence in Iran. And the British feared th that these Germans would constitute a fifth column, would attempt to uh, establish a pro-German government in Tehran, or would engage in sabotage of oil installations and vital communications networks. But there was a second weightier and unstated reason. Operation Barbarossa, the German invasion of Russia in July 1941, meant access to the overland route from the Persian Gulf across Iran to supply a Russia hard pressed by Hitler's armies had become crucial to the war effort of the Allies. But uh, use of this route was, of course, incompatible with Iranian neutrality, hence the invasion. And having occupied Iran and needing full control of Iran's railways, roads, ports, uh, airports, and communication systems, and anticipating that Reza Shah might not, uh, might resist or even obstruct full cooperation with the Allies, <clears throat> the British next engineered Reza Shah's abdication. They did so in a number of ways. The Foreign Secretary, Antony Eden, authorized the BBC in its Persian language broadcasts to launch an intensive multi-day uh, critique of Reza Shah's government for jailings and executions, for manipulating elections and uh, controlling the press, for amassing personal wealth at public expense, and much more. 
broadcasts that made clear to Reza Shah himself and his cabinet that the British did not want him on the throne. Also, directly and indirectly, the British ambassador in Tehran, Sir Reader Bullard, <clears throat> made clear to the Iranian prime minister as, and foreign minister that the succession of Reza Shah's eldest son, Mohammad Reza, to the throne was itself at risk if Reza Shah did not immediately abdicate, uh, transfer all his wealth to the state for public welfare, and leave Iran, taking all his other sons with him. The British even briefly uh, toyed with the improbable idea of returning the former dynasty, the Qajars, whom Reza Shah had overthrown uh, to the throne. Uh, Eden, in addition, knew with near certainty that Reza Shah, fearing, fearing the Russians would arrest him if they occupied the capital, which the allies had so far refrained from doing, <clears throat> On September 16, Russian and British forces <clears throat> marched into the capital and occupied it. And Reza Shah, as foreseen, um, abdicated and prepared to go into exile. Having abdicated, Reza Shah anticipated or was under the impression that he would be free to choose his own place of exile. And the women in the family, had settled our, on Argentina, uh, a country with which they had no familiarity, but which they thought would be suitable due to its climate and its distance from the theaters of war. The British, however, had no intention of allowing Reza Shah to settle in South America or in any neutral country where they believed he, may, he might engage in intrigue, become a focus of Nazi propaganda and intrigue, and the, and the focus of unwelcome media attention. They wanted him firmly in British hands somewhere in the British Empire. They initially decided on India, but the Viceroy, Lord Linlithgow, uh, was unwilling to allow Reza Shah to set foot in India, much less to settle there. After a hasty search for an alternative, the British settled on the island of Mauritius. It was sufficiently remote and isolated, and the governor, Sir Bede Clifford, agreed to host uh, Reza Shah. Reza Shah himself, however, was not told that rather than South America, uh, Mauritius would be his destination until he was aboard a British ship, the SS Bandra, uh, uh, on, uh, at, the, at, the, at the Indian port of Bombay. Feeling betrayed, he uh, responded with anger and fired off letters to British officials. But the reality was he was uh, helpless to do anything about it, and he yielded to the inevitable. By now, the fierce and formidable ruler whose uh, ferocious temper could leave his ministers quaking with fear had grown decidedly less imperious. His country had been invaded and occupied. His beloved army has, had collapsed under British pressure and to save the throne for his son, he had abdicated and was leaving the country to which he had devoted so much of his life. Something in the man had broken. 
as he made his way across Iran and into exile, his daughters saw before them a stooped, suddenly aged man. He was no longer given to his ferocious fits of temper. For the first time in anyone's memory, he complained that he was tired. For the first time, members of the family uh, saw tears in his eyes. He grew dismissive of the trappings of royalty that once had surrounded him. Bring it down, he said, when he saw his picture in the office of the director of customs at the Iranian port of Bandar Abbas. There's no need for my picture anymore. To a former minister who came to see him on official business but feared incurring his anger, he said, don't be afraid. I don't count for anything anymore. Listening on Tehran radio, to the attacks on him by newly emboldened Majlis parliamentary deputies, he remarked bitterly, I quote, no sooner I set foot outside Tehran than the same persons who always praised and were sycophantic about my work and my actions are now singing a different tune. By the time Reza Shah and his family boarded the SS Bandra, the royal party was large. There was Reza Shah and his wife, her half-sister and lady-in-waiting, six sons, three daughters, uh, his private secretary, his son-in-law, uh, a cook, and a number of servants. Before he abdicated, and as the British insisted before he had turned all his property to his son for use in the public welfare, Reza Shah had been a very wealthy man. He had amassed a great deal of land, not by the most commendable means, uh, and owned by some estimates 2000 villages or parts of villages across Iran. In his bank account, there was, at the 1941 exchange rate, 10 million pounds in his bank account. Now, he was going into exile with a party of 19 with no money of his own. I haven't a penny to my name, he said. Where am I to go with this hoard? Eventually, his money problems in exile were resolved by uh, regular transfers from his son, the ruling Shah. In exile in Mauritius, uh, Reza Shah was no longer a free man. The British, of course, determined his place of exile and the conditions of this exile. Also, the degree of freedom they were willing to allow him and his family. They censored his mail. They decided if members of his family from Iran could visit him. And they, and if any uh, members of his party in Mauritius wished to leave the island to return to Iran or travel elsewhere, British permission was required. The Foreign Office had issued guidelines to the governor of Mauritius that although modified from time to time, governed the British handling of Reza Shah until his death in 1944. Clifford was told that there was no intention of treating Reza Shah as a prisoner. On the contrary, every effort should be made uh, to make his stay as comfortable as possible. Uh, Clifford was told, and I quote, it is only proposed that a discreet that a discreet surveillance should be exercised so that the ex Shah should not feel slighted. However, in the event the ex Shah or his family should attempt to cause political or other trouble in the colony, you have full discretion 
to restrict their freedom of movement by any means. <clears throat> Once in Mauritius, Reza Shah was beyond the reach of German or enemy agents, but British officials with no reason as it turned out, continued um, to be concerned that he would cause them trouble. For example, on the eve of Reza Shah's arrival in Mauritius, uh, an official of the colonial office observed that there were on the island 40 to 50,000 Muslims among whom Reza Shah might attempt to make trouble with perhaps assistance of the pro Vichy element among the Franco Mauritians. In that event, the official added, uh, the governor might find it necessary to take firm action. All these concerns proved groundless. Reza Shah displayed no interest in engaging in intrigue or causing trouble among the Muslim community or connecting with the pro Vichy element among the Franco Mauritians. He disapproved of members of his family, the adults, as well as the children, of even mixing with the Europeans on the island. All he wanted was to be left alone. In his seven months on the island, he left his home and his compound only twice. He restricted himself with walking in its gardens. Mauritius with its public parks, its uh, green spaces, its abundance of flowers and mild, if very rainy climate <clears throat> was hardly an unattractive place. And Governor Clifford went out of his way to make Reza Shah feel welcome. He appointed a very capable <clears throat> uh, research physicist <clears throat> to serve <clears throat> excuse me, to serve as Reza Shah's um, aid and to see to his needs. The house that the governor's uh, aides has, had found for Reza Shah was a fine three-story residence in uh, a large garden in one of the best districts of Port Louis, the Mauritian capital. Um, Clifford uh, selected uh, the best French cooks on the island to staff the house. His wife, Alice Clifford, furnished it with furniture she had found, French Empire furniture she had found in the Port Louis Museum. The furniture had belonged to Napoleon's general, Charles de Caen, when the French were in control of the island. She was particularly proud of a magnificent four uh, poster bread she, she decorated with a royal crown. To her disappointment, Reza Shah refused the bed and he slept, as was his habit, on a rug on the floor. Reza Shah intensely disliked Mauritius. The wet, damp climate did not suit him. He felt he was a captive on an island surrounded by water. He yearned, he said, for the cool, bracing uh, climate of his mountainous country. He complained that he slept badly at night. Visibly despondent, he avoided contact with anyone outside his immediate family. When Governor Clifford, at tea with Reza Shah after he had been settled, asked him if he was comfortable, if all his needs were being met, Reza Shah replied, what shall I say? We are prisoners. We are used to great open spaces and the mountains. To us, this existence is like a death in life. Once he abdicated, and while, and while still on Iranian soil, <clears throat> Reza Shah 
abandoned the military uniform he almost always wore for civilian clothes. He hated wearing suits, but for some reason, he decided that no longer Shah or commander in chief, he, he did not deserve military dress. His son-in-law in Mauritius to ease his discomfort pointed out that Napoleon had continued to wear a military uniform even in exile on the island of St. Helena, but to no avail. As was his lifetime habit, he established for himself a routine to which he strictly adhered down to the time of day. He had his first cigarette, he had his morning and afternoon tea, and he had his meals. As was normal for him, he rose early, usually at 5 a.m., <clears throat> and had his breakfast alone. After breakfast, he walked for two hours. After lunch with the family, he walked again, and he walked again in the evening. To Clifford and his staff, this penchant for walking seemed what they called vigorous exercise and excessive. To underline that he was a prisoner and despite pleading by members of his family that he joined them for an outing to a movie or somewhere else, he refused. I'm a prisoner, he told his son-in-law, and I must behave like a prison. The only one of two times he ventured out of his home was to attend a formal black tie dinner given by the governor, by Governor Clifford, to mark the signing of the tripartite agreement between Iran, uh, Britain, and the Soviet Union to regularize the presence of the allies in Iran. Even then, he did not join his family for the entire evening. Only after dinner was concluded, his son-in-law picked him up. He found Reza Shah sitting on his bed, uh, partially and uncomfortably dressed in the black tie suit that had been sewn for him by Indian tailors when at the port in Bombay. He had his bow tie in his hands. He said to his son-in-law, God grant me death. What is this harness I must wear around my neck? From the moment he arrived in Mauritius, Reza Shah pressed to go elsewhere, to Canada, to America, to South Africa, to Argentina. Again and again, he mentioned relocation to his aide, Tonkin. He asked Clifford to raise the matter with his government, pointing out that at no time during the war had he acted against British interests. He was concerned only to adhere to strict uh, neutrality. Had the British uh, been open with him, requiring uh, uh, open with him uh, about their requirements, he said he would have been uh, ready to negotiate. He asked his son, the ruling Shah, to raise the matter of relocation with the British ambassador in Tehran, as the son did repeatedly. The British were not sympathetic. A move involved considerable cost, uh, extensive arrangements, finding transport for a large family in a time of war and securing the agreement of officials in, a, in another part of the empire to accept Reza Shah. <clears throat> As one official at the foreign office put it, we are under no obligation, moral or contractual in this matter. I do not see that we have anything to gain from moving him. However, there were other considerations. Governor Clifford <clears throat> was concerned 
that Reza Shah might grow more despondent and that his health might deteriorate if he were kept on the island against his will. <clears throat> the Shah in Tehran was pressing his father's case and the allies required his cooperation. The tripartite treaty intended to put the presence of British and uh, uh, Soviet troops on Iranian soil on a more friendly and uh, formal footing was under negotiation and yet to be signed. And the negotiations had proved difficult. Eden eventually relented and agreed to allow Reza Shah to relocate to Canada as he wished once the tripartite treaty was signed. And the treaty was signed in January, 1942. Reza Shah was finally able to leave Mauritius. The plan was for him to go by sea from Mauritius to Durban in South Africa, and there to transfer to a larger ocean going vessel for the voyage to Canada. However, <clears throat> once in Canada, once in, in, sorry, once in Durban in South Africa, Reza Shah took a liking to South Africa. He decided he did not want to risk the ocean voyage at a time of war and did not want to go to Canada at all. He asked to stay in uh, South Africa. And Jan Smuts, the South African uh, prime minister agreed allowed Reza Shah to reside in Johannesburg and to be treated, moreover, as a distinguished visitor. These events explain how Reza Shah spent the last two years of his life in Johannesburg. <clears throat> Reza Shah felt far more content in Johannesburg than he had been in Mauritius. <clears throat> The climate suited him well and was closer to the Iranian uplands, which he loved. In Mauritius, he took his long walks in the city streets themselves. Uh, as always, he was attentive to everything he saw. At 65, Reza Shah had left Iran only twice. The first time as prime minister in 1924, he paid a very brief pilgrimage to the Shia holy places in neighboring Iraq. And as Shah, he uh, visited Turkey as a guest of uh, President Ataturk. He had never seen for himself a modern European country, the kind of country he hoped Iran would become. Now he was struck to see uh, European style cities in Africa. He was impressed by the multi story buildings, <clears throat> the orderliness of people getting on and off trains and going about their business. He was particularly struck by the large presence of women uh, in the public space, uh, dressed, as he put it, in men's clothes and driving taxis and even trucks. <clears throat> he was surprised to learn that the grocer and the washerwoman who came to his house were driving their own cars. The isolation he felt in Mauritius was also relieved by his ability to receive visitors from Iraq. In June 1942, he received a confidant of his son, the ruling Shah, with letters and a phonograph recording. Remember those? A phonograph recording of greetings from, father, from son to father. In April of the following year, 1943, his second eldest daughter, Princess Ashraf, came to spend six weeks with her father. Reza Shah is always hungry for news from Iran. <coughs> Uh, eagerly read the letters and newspapers she brought with her and bombarded her, bombarded her with questions about her son. <clears throat> he continued the ritual he had begun in Mauritius of listening every evening to the Persian 
radio broadcasts of the BBC and the Berlin radio, and when it could be accessed, Tehran radio as well. When Reza Shah took up residence in, uh, uh, in Johannesburg, British officials were concerned that the Af South African color bar uh, would prove problematic or lead to embarrassing moments. As W.H. Young at the Foreign Office observed, the ex-Shah and his family are bound to have uncomfortable moments. Unfortunately, they are a rather dark-skinned family. And Tong King, the aide who accompanied Reza Shah from Mauritius to Johannesburg added, the whole problem, the whole situation is further complicated in that they look on themselves as being completely and wholly white. As it turned out, these fears were not borne out. No incidents involving members of the royal family and the color bar were reported by British officials and members of the family in interviews conducted some years after these events recalled no unpleasant color uh, bar related experiences during uh, the family South African stay. The older boys seem to have encountered no problems in enjoying what entertainments Johannesburg, Johannesburg had to offer or to engage in what Tonkin called their amorous adventures. Another source of concern was that Reza Shah's five sons were not getting a proper education. The Shah in Tehran was unhappy to hear that his brother's only amusements <clears throat> were cinemas and cabarets and that they were neglecting their studies. The boys did have some tutoring in Johannesburg, but it was spotty. The attempts mostly to no avail to arrange for a proper education for the boys involved in time, officials in London and Johannesburg, the Royal Court in Tehran, the Iranian ambassadors in Cairo, uh, the Iranian and, Brit and British ambassadors in, in Cairo, and even the director of the British Council based in London. These efforts I mentioned because they serve as a kind of a mirror to the dislocation, the loss of moorings, the royal family experience in exile. The three oldest boys at around 18, 19, and 20 when, jo when in Johannesburg were already beyond school age. Uh, Reza Shah thought of sending them to Tehran but the British ambassador thought this a bad idea. He cabled the foreign office that they would not complete their education. They would idle away their time and get into bad habits. And he added, the Shah agreed with him. The two younger boys aged 16 and 17 could not attend the local schools. Their level of education was low uh, they lacked the necessary language skills and the color bar uh, presented another problem. Um, over the next, the whole next year and longer, different proposals were considered and uh, for one reason or another dropped. In the end, uh, the two younger boys were sent to Iran and the three older ones remained with their father in Johannesburg. Although members of the royal family were, were much freer in Johannesburg than they had been in Mauritius, <clears throat> British oversight remained, including censorship of letters and uh, restrictions regarding visitors and travel. The application of these restrictions was common. For example, in uh, 1943, uh, the Foreign Secretary, Eden 
uh, directed that Reza Shah should not be allowed to receive any further visits from members of his family. <clears throat> By early 1944, Reza Shah himself had been noticeably growing more reclusive. His private secretary, Ali Izadi, noted that he avoided people, had grown attuned to being by himself, and rarely ventured down from his room before noon. He always ate his meals in his room alone. The advent of Nowruz, the Iranian New Year, which uh, coincides with the spring equinox, and which Iranian families traditionally celebrate together as a moment of rebirth, of hope, and of high expectations, <clears throat> was always the most difficult time of the year for Reza Shah. Marking Nowruz in March 1944, Reza Shah seemed to his private secretary, Izadi, more crestfallen than usual. To his daughter, Shams, in Iran, he wrote, my health is not bad, but as to my state of mind, it is better not to speak. Repeatedly, he asked to be permitted to relocate to a place still in the British Empire, but nearer home where members of his family could more easily visit him. He told his sons in March, 1944, he hoped this would be the last year of his life. British officials were unmoved. If Reza Shah were relocated nearer to Iran, they observed, this would suggest the British were planning to bring Reza Shah back to Iran and this would have a disturbing political effect in Iran itself. And Bullard, the British ambassador in Tehran, noted, as you know, we are anxious that he should remain as far away as possible from Persia. As a result, Tom King was instructed to inform Reza Shah that he must stay in Johannesburg for the present and for the duration of the war. Tonkin did so and reported to his superiors, quote, he took it well, but said that as soon as the war in Europe was over, he was leaving even, his, if, even, even if on foot. I told him, Tonkin added, I, I should be delighted to walk with him. <clears throat> By June 1944, Reza Shah's physical condition, too, had visibly deteriorated, and he had grown much weaker. He complained that he felt unwell, but as usual, he refused medication or medical attention. He was now taking his daily walk in his own room, and his private secretary, Izadi, noticed one morning that even this brief pacing was difficult for him. He suffered a, a heart attack before dawn on the morning of June 25, but attended by a team of physicians, he seemed to recover. <clears throat> the arrival of his daughter, Princess Shams, in mid-July boosted his spirits. On the evening of July, uh, 25, with Shams there, he chatted and engaged in the banter he sometimes used with his staff. But the recovery proved brief. Early on the morning of July 26, uh, Izadi, the private secretary, was awakened by loud knocking on his bedroom door. It was Reza Shah's servant, Mahmoud. Reza Shah won't wake up, he said. Izadi dressed and hurried to Reza Shah's side. He appeared to Izadi to be sleeping. Izadi later recalled the look on his face was peaceful. There was no sign of death on it. His hand 
was still warm to Izadi's touch. How is your excellency's health? He asked. His master did not respond. Reza Shah had passed away. His long unhappy exile had ended. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Bachos. It's really, I was thinking that, you know, reading your book, which I've not got to the end because I only having ordered the uh, copy a while ago, only arrived um, two days ago. I mean, first of all, it really, it's a page turner. And I say that as a compliment, that it really, in part, it's, you know, like a John Le Carre novel that it's intriguing and it is, full of such amazing details, the minutia of, uh, like I said, you know, the frogs uh, singing away in Mauritius, annoying him and all that. There are several questions coming through and can I invite our audience to please uh, type your questions in the chat. And I wanted, before I turn to the questions, um, this is such a painstakingly thorough, uh, research for these details where they did did you um interview uh descendants perhaps of some of the retinue there as well as the um you know the documented material you you depict the image of this broken man and his you know desolate state in some way so clearly that it's almost as if it's like a documentary, as if there is a camera on the wall watching him. No, I didn't really get a Thank chance to, to interview uh, anyone, but the, the documents speak for themselves, really. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, members of his family in, in year, years later did uh, conduct interviews mm. Uh, for a couple of projects here in the United States. And so I had those records as well. Good, I think fantastic. Well, I'll pause my own questions. And if I turn uh, to our audience, so there are a couple of comments, perhaps, as well as uh, questions by um, Dr. Bagoy Yazdi, who says that um, listening to a, a uh, and reading about an interview that uh, Professor Anne Lampton had given to Professor Abbas Milani. And in that, she is supposed to have said that Reza Shah, at the time when he left Iran, had no money in any British bank. And the idea that he had any was simply propaganda against him conducted by the BBC Persian radio. Would you like to comment on that? Uh, yes, I think that's that's uh, exactly the case. That okay. that it was rumored he had bank accounts abroad, but he himself said uh, to an aide that he had no money except the money he had in in Iranian yeah. banks, which was considerable, mm. um, and and none abroad. And in fact, because um, the in fact, I came across a comment which is in the book that at some stage. Um, uh, foreign office officials uh, uh, remarked that uh, the, these rumors of his external bank accounts have served their purpose and really we should drop them. They've become an embarrassment. Oh, um, um, and But because this was picked up by the newly emboldened Iranian mm -hmm. parliament, the government after his departure asked British um, uh, embassies abroad to inquire about whether Reza Shah had bank accounts abroad and none were discovered. No, for that. <clears throat> it, it goes without saying that our um, uh, audience are uh, writing in to thank you for such a fantastic talk. I mean, that it really does not read repeating. Another question is, um, Regarding that the contacts that Reza Shah had, you mentioned, uh, for example, um, uh, Princess Ashraf coming and bringing some letters and newspapers and the uh, uh, recordings of his son. But the question is that, was he in touch with any of the notable 
former military commanders or political figures or any clerics that were left in Iran, any evidence of communications with them? Uh, no, and of course, clerics, I would doubt it. As <laughs> <laughs> Reza Shah just, yeah. broke the power of the clergy of course, in Iran. Yeah. No, there, there was none. Well, first of all, as I said, there was this uh, strong British control over whom he saw, who we heard from, the mail was censored. And in fact, uh, um, I came across records of, of the letters in the British archives, the letters that had been censored. The British were very concerned that no note of discontent with conditions, particularly in Mauritius, Mauritius reached the royal court in Tehran. So any letter that complained about conditions was censored. And the royal family itself commented afterwards, they, they felt unfree to speak their real minds in their letters to Tehran. Mm. And the daughters that you mentioned, Shams and Ashraf, they, they went back and forth between uh, Tehran and uh, um, South Africa, or no, they were in a third country. That bit I'm not clear. No, uh, the, 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 the Princess Shams, uh, the second eldest daughter, and her yes. husband, yes. Uh, Feridun Jam, Jam, accompanied Reza Shah to Mauritius. Yes in exile, but then yes. she uh, she later tired of it and, and went back home and then visited mm -hmm. him uh, for that yes. on, 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 the, on one occasion, as Absolutely. I explained. And Princess Ashraf mm -hmm. visited him one, once and stayed with him. Yes. Uh, Shams came the second, I mean, came back when Reza Shah was already, uh, already ill and that there was concern about that. And although, as I mentioned, um, Eden had instructed that no more visitors from Iran be allowed. They made an exception in this case because he was ill. Because he was ill. I understand. A question, uh, um, uh, Professor Bachosh, that with all this that you have laid out and followed on by, um, you know, the 1953 coup, this is a question that you might anticipate what I'm going to ask. Do you not think it is correct and fair that Iranians are paranoid and believe in conspiracy theorists? I mean, you know, do we need more evidence? Yes, I mean, there is this very conspiratorial set of mind uh, among Iranians about the British, who are still regarded as behind everything. Um, I mean, after all, they had. Uh, well, there was, first of all, a belief that the British actually brought Reza Shah to the throne. Yes. Then, of course, they overthrew him. They saved um, Muhammad Reza Shah's crown for him in 1953. Mm -hmm. You know, during the Iranian revolution, as these demonstrations were taking place, these huge demonstrations, uh, the Shah himself told Anthony Parsons, the British ambassador, we, meaning we Iranians, say you lift a mullah's beard and there'll be a British flag underneath. Yes. Right. Yes. Uh, now on to, I'm um, um, combining two more personal um, uh, questions, querying. One is, could you speak a bit about the father and son relationship during exile, if you have any insight on that? And another is, could you describe, you know, depict the picture of Reza Shah's wife who accompanied him in exile? Um, uh, as to son and father and son, I really came across no correspondence between them, which is very surprising. Very straight, yeah. Um, Although, well, he did, I suppose, yes, he did, I'm sorry, he did receive letters, but they were very general. And, uh, and he wrote his son, usually concerned about Iran or instructions about how to, um, how to, you know, what things to do. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> nothing very revealing, I would say, no. or unusual. Um, as to, you asked, I'm sorry, the second part of your question was, 
correspondent. Yeah, for the uh, wife and and then and, and his wife. Any any documents about her life in exile, Reza Shah's wife? Not about her life in exile, mm -hmm. but she did go home. Yeah. Uh, and then and then from Iran continued to ply Reza Shah with letters complaining she didn't have <laughs> enough money. <laughs> okay, so there is there aren't many observations by the hosts or the British of, of her demeanor or her no, it's a, it's persona very, for that. Thing. Very good question and surprise. Yeah. Well, I would say not surprising enough, but not and I suppose because she, yeah. you know, played a back role. Really. Of course, it, it's yeah. not surprising. Uh, two other questions is um, so one is. Um, uh, you mentioned that obviously Brits uh, were not keen on Argentina. They wanted him uh, on there where they could reach him. Therefore, why did they not send him to Canada and why South Africa? Originally, I mean, perhaps, you know, why would they not, if he wasn't keen on Mauritius and perhaps on Argentina, and why, why was he not sent to Canada? Well, I can only tell you that yeah. when when the viceroy in India refused to have him, mm. uh, the, the search for an alternate was really frantic. I mean, they even considered Kenya, mm -hmm. the Seychelles, I forget, but it's in my Which book, but the number yes. of places they wrote to asking whether they would take him. Yes. But curiously enough, Canada wasn't one of them. Yeah. But when Reza Shah then was so eager to leave, uh, 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 the, the Canadian government was consulted and permission, mm -hmm. uh, the Canadian government agreed to receive him. And interesting enough, the, what the Canadian government was told was almost exactly what the, uh, what the government in Mauritius was told that, you know, nothing more is required than discreet surveillance. Yeah. Of course, you will censor their letters. Um, and additionally, we will bear the cost, the Canadian government yeah. should not. Yeah. Uh, uh, but that was only when, you know, after Reza Shah, it was one of the countries he wanted to go to and, and after they decided to allow him to, to move. Yeah. Yeah. And then you go. Uh, a question from uh, Dr. Kava Musavi that um, in the course of such detailed research, um, what, what did your research influence your own assessment of Reza Shah compared to what image you might have had before? And do you view him a little more sympathetically? You know, I, I always, uh, I think like most of us had mixed feelings about him. I and mean, clearly he was extraordinarily capable. He inherited or took over, I should say, in Iran that was financially very weak, unable to control its own borders, unable to control the tribes, a political class that didn't seem to be able to accomplish anything, uh, <clears throat> a country in which the great powers interfered. And he built it into something. So certainly I was admired him for that. Yeah. Um, I also believed, and I still do, that he, when he left, he didn't leave behind the kind, he left behind a very strong state. And really the institutions of that state uh, survive today under the Islamic Republic. Mm -hmm. But he didn't leave behind institutions that might have led as they did in, in Ataturk's Turkey mm -hmm. to democratic institutions, a stronger parliament, uh, a, a press free to speak out, mm -hmm. habit of mind among officials of, uh, uh, of being independent instead of being sycophantic. Uh, so I was always critical of him for that and remain so to this day. Yeah. But I did, I must say, come out of the research, yes, more sympathetic, particularly to his uh, trials in exile, yeah. and also uh, more appreciative of a man who, after all, came out of a village, had very little education mm -hmm. himself, um, 
And it is astonishing that he absorbed, he somehow managed to absorb all these modern ideas about reform, about schools and education, um, about the quote, liberation unquote of women and so forth and so on, which is really when you think about it, surprising that how did this man with his very limited uh, kind of contacts and world uh, uh, buy into the ideas of the reformers and the modernists. Yes, for that. Um, I know that, you know, the answer is in your book, but I am going to ask um, that um, a question about um, the uh, account of Reza Shah's journey through Iran, obviously yes. uh, going towards India and the next time. Um, do, do, are there many um, uh, accounts of his stay in Esfahan and uh, uh, Kerman on the way to Bandar Abbas, as you mentioned? Are there any um, you know, records of how he might have been received and encounters with the local um, you, you know, dignitaries, his treatment by them? Yes, I do describe these in, in, in my yes. book. Uh, <laughs> Uh, he, I, as I say in my book, this was hardly uh, the typical royal progress. Um, it was very hurried. Uh, Reza Shah sent his family uh, ahead. He followed himself later with only a chauffeur driving him. Mm -hmm. His car broke down. <laughs> uh, his son-in-law saw him. He, they switched to another call, emerging. Uh, out of a battered car with just his uh, uh, briefcase in his hand. Um, so, and then, uh, you know, some of the people who hosted him uh, left memoirs. Mm -hmm. So we do, and on this, on this trip out of Iran, uh, he did reminisce some about what he had done as, as king for the country. He also was uh, was uh, capable of a bit of humor. Mm -hmm. For example, it just so happened, I forget in which of the cities in which he stayed on his way out of Iran, that the <clears throat> several of the people who came to see him uh, were limping. And he said, all our affairs are limping. <laughs> yes, like it does. And, yeah. uh, he said to his host, I believe in Isfahan, uh, uh, given his own penchant for penchant while king for taking other people's land. He joked yeah. with his host, I didn't know you had such a fine house. I'd have told them to take it from you. Yeah. So there are accounts, very yeah, nice accounts, that, like that, that all, yeah. which yeah. I reflect in my book. Yes. So a question um, uh, that comes from uh, that you mentioned that the Viceroy of India would not let him in. Why? The question is why? Well, as there is, as I mentioned in the talk, he was concerned that the presence of a Muslim king who the British had deposed or forced out of uh, his country mm -hmm would allow the Muslim leadership, of the leadership of the Muslim community in India, uh, uh, particularly Jinnah, to take advantage of this, uh, to make trouble for the British in, in India. In India, that, that's very clear. Another question says that, um, why um, the British thought that they could not work with Reza Shah left as a ruler of a neutral country? Uh, would Reza have countenanced a reduced wa wartime role for himself in Iran? And why was working with, with his son thought any less likely to lead to complications? Um, and, you know, should the son reach out to Germany? Why did they think that, you know, the son would be different and not the father? I think it's a very good question and it puzzles me myself. It, it just so happened that um, immediately after I graduated from college in the United States, I spent a year at Oxford and Sir Rita Bullard gave a lecture and I asked him 
two questions mm -hmm. then, which I couldn't use because they weren't documented. <clears throat> but I asked him whether uh, Had Reza Shah, as the British insisted, uh, expelled a very large number of Germans from Iran, would they still have, have invaded? He said, yes, we had to have an overland route. Yeah. And I asked him whether they'd ever asked or put this to Reza Shah, told him about their needs um, and seen his reaction. He said, no. So, and I don't know why they did not do it. They, yeah. Perhaps they thought he, he wouldn't uh, agree. Perhaps they thought the Germans would learn about it. Uh, I have no idea, but they did. They never put to Reza Shah their uh, wartime needs and 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 okay. uh, saw what his reaction would be. Um, as to you know the the concern about the German presence, well, you know they really were deeply involved in Iran. They were the principal source of machinery for Iranian factories and plants. They were involved in the railways. They were involved in communications. So you know the fear that they would cause trouble for Britain. If, if they uh, uh, were so deeply involved in government affairs was I think not itself misplaced. But the uh, rather common belief that Reza Shah himself was pro-German mm. in, in that sense, yes. you know, pro-Hitler, yes. pro-Nazi. Yes. There's no evidence for it whatsoever in the archives. And Bullard himself in one of his dispatches said, that even as he was complaining about the German presence, uh, said that were Reza Shah uh, free to, to speak openly, his sympathies would be with us. Mm -hmm. So he realized that That's too. Amazing. And I don't think Reza Shah really ever fully grasped the kind of regime Hitler had established in Germany and the atrocities that he was committing. He simply was not knowledgeable about them. No, no that is really, I am conscious of time uh, marching on and I thought take advantage of having the mic myself. And I'm sure I'll find the uh, answer when I get to the end of the book. And Russians were happy with this. There was never a competition that let us have him and exile him to where we would like to. You mean they were happy with? So the Brits uh, sort of, or, or perhaps they thought you can have the trouble. I mean, what was, uh, well, there must have been some discussion. Well, at some I, you know, I, I, I had no uh, access <laughs> to this. So I had no access to the Soviet archive, yeah. but there never, there was never any, uh, there was no expression in the British archives of, of Russian discontent with, okay. yes. with these arrangements. They probably, I don't know, they sort of assumed that that's, the British would take him into exile. They had enough on their own uh, place, yeah. I think, with the thing. Well, Professor Bachosh, this really, I, I could have another hour easily, <sighs> and I can't wait. I tell you, I keep thinking, I mustn't get into the book. I have essays to mark, I have classes to organize. And I'm really looking forward and I recommend to our audience, it is, you know, we're so close to this period of history and yet so uninformed about such details. And it, it is a very good read. I hope you don't mind me saying that, Professor Bachos. Really, I'm very pleased to hear you say that. It's wonderful. <laughs> and so it remains for me to thank you very much for taking the time to deliver this talk for us. And of course, on behalf of all our audience and on behalf of Center for Iranian Studies, I wish you a very happy New Ruz, which we're only about a day and you know six or seven hours away. And we very much hope that you will return and talk to us. There is so many, such a wealth of knowledge and such clear analysis that I have several questions from our postgraduate students who you know, really thank you very much for this fascinating uh, eye-opening talk, as well as depicting such a 
personal picture of a man who we only recognize as a formidable, you know, frightening um, man. So thank you so much. And thank you so much to our wonderful audience who staying with us. <laughs> and we wish you all a very nice new century, very new and a happy Easter. And all our Druid uh, uh, audience, if they're amongst you, because at Stonehenge, they will be celebrating the passage of the earth through vernal equinox. So all in all, a very auspicious time. Thank you so much, Professor Bach. Thank you for inviting me. Not at all. My pleasure. And now, Bye. good night to all. For you is in the afternoon. So we'll let you perhaps have time for a late lunch. Thank you, Aki. Thank you, Aki. Bye. <laughs>